me to detox from dopamine, if you look up dopamine fasting 2.0, dopamine detox, I found abstaining from masturbation, porn completely, and just focusing on my relationship and intimacy. Me avoiding any snacks whatsoever, just focusing on enjoying a meal, taking bites, but chewing many times and enjoying that. Being present, noticing the air, noticing the sun, noticing the sounds around you, instead of being distracted with the cell phone or whatever else, the TV, whatever else is around you, being truly present. Like this, the dopamine fasting thing has been very powerful for me. And that's led to me being able to do the next one, which is getting in line with who I want to be spiritually, physically, mentally, and keeping my word, most importantly, not only to you and everyone around me, but to myself. Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. It is my pleasure to have Sean Wells with us. Sean is the world's leading nutritional biochemist and expert on health optimization. He's formulated over a thousand supplements, foods, beverages, and cosmeceuticals, and patented 25 novel ingredients, including paraxanthine, tecrine, dynamine, and dihydroberberine, and is now known as the ingredientologist, the scientist of ingredients, formerly a chief clinical dietitian with over a decade of clinical experience. He has counseled thousands of people on innovative health solutions such as keto, paleo, fasting, supplements. He's also personally overcome various health issues, including Epstein-Barr virus, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, depression, insomnia, obesity, and a pituitary tumor. As a world-renowned thought leader on mitochondrial health, he has been paid to speak on five different continents. His insights have been prominently featured in documentaries such as Psychedelics Revealed and Supplements Revealed and podcasts like Ben Greenfield, as well as regularly appearing on morning television. His book, The Energy Formula, has been recognized by both USA Today and Forbes, as well as an Amazon bestseller in multiple categories. Sean, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Yeah. So I think we met at uh, the Biohacking Congress. It's, mm -hmm. Or was it Biohacking Conference? I forget. <laughs> I think it was Biohacking Congress in Miami. I think the Congress, yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's great to finally have you on the show. I'm curious to hear more about your origin story, how you ended up focusing in this area and you had all these health issues. Wow. That was quite a, a ride, I'm sure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No, for sure. Like it's it's been a journey and now it feels like the hero's journey, but in the process, not so much. It, it just felt like overwhelming. And really it, it led me to points of of very dark places with suicidal thoughts and some pretty heavy depression along the way, just from a, a difficult childhood, bullying at school, things were difficult at home, and two brothers run away and just, it was difficult without getting into to too much detail. And it led to me being a, a junk food junkie and eating everything and anything that had sugar or caffeine and becoming morbidly obese becoming the butt of everyone's jokes, including teachers. And, and it was just a difficult process that ended up leading to a lot of sickness, like physical and mental sickness, where I had fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, Hashimoto's, Epstein-Barr. I've had brain tumors. I've had about 30 different surgeries where things were failing. It's been a lot. A lot of that was just because of my mental health and then how I was fueling my body. But along with it, I had this gaslighting of myself, this perfectionism where I was now the abuser, the worst abuser to me that led me to be in very suicidal places. You know, at one point physically, I couldn't get out of bed for about six months with all these autoimmune issues. And that was another point that I just was ready to kill myself because I thought I could never contribute to the world. I could never have my dreams. I could never pursue these things. But that's what led to my passion around nutrition and supplementation is finding my way out of bed and then finding my way out of my head to where I can find mental health again, find physical vibrance again. So I'm here before you after all that. And it's not like, you know, I'm all better. I think I have a tendency towards being an empath, being a, a deep feeler, a deep thinker. I tend to be more introverted and it can be 
you know, even now I can have some dark moments, but now I have the tools to you know, get myself back on track very quickly. Wow. Thank you for sharing so candidly such vulnerability you went through. What was the the darkest part of all this? What was the point where you hit bottom? I think really when I was, I mean, it was a few places. Like I went from being morbidly obese to being anorexic, where I went from about 300 pounds at six foot three to 150 pounds in a very short period of time. And people were clearly worried about me and I looked emaciated. I had severe body dysmorphia and dysmorphia ordered eating. I think, you know, that was a very dark point where I almost didn't physically live, but also like I mentally considered food my enemy, you know, went from being like something I was obsessed with to being my enemy. I had dreams of like hacking fat off my body, like with a cleaver, hated like the way I looked. And so even when I was like 150 pounds, like I still thought I was fat. It was, it was very, uh, you know, those were dark points. And then Again, that, that period where I was just in bed for many months, I really couldn't get out of bed because of the chronic fatigue, as well as the fibromyalgia, like literally my whole body felt inflamed and like nerves were just ringing pain constantly. And so I didn't know how to get out of bed and, and live again. But it was me digging into nutrition, digging into these supplements that really helped me find my way through that. Wow. What was the biggest improvement in terms of uh, getting out of chronic pain and chronic fatigue, uh, being able to get out of bed. There must have been one supplement, one regimen or, or modality that really made a huge impact for you at the beginning of this uh, healing journey. Well, I mean, one, that the mental shift that I've been working on for many years, probably the last 20 years and and plant medicine helped dramatically with, and I could tell you a lot about that. Like that was probably the biggest game changer, but that was only four years ago. But it's really granting myself grace. That was a thing I had to learn when I was gaslighting myself, abusive to myself, expecting perfection all the time. As far as supplements, I think pre-supplement, it was me getting on like a, a paleolithic ketogenic diet um, that really switched up a lot for me when uh, ketones, I, I was always metabolically dysfunctional because of all the sugar and trans fats and calories I was constantly consuming, or basically there was periods when I was consuming nothing. Um, so I was rarely getting proper nutrition and to get on like a, a paleo ketogenic diet, like really helped me get back on track, get my metabolism back on track, get the nutrients I needed. And then that's when I could start like just walking outside and it took many months for me to get back up to full speed. I mean, maybe even years. So, you know, it was a slow process as far as supplements. There's a few supplements that really got me out of autoimmune hell. And I would say that was AHCC, which is a compound that comes from certain mushrooms. It has a lot of research with cancer and autoimmune conditions. That was a powerful one. There's an amino acid called L-lysine that was a, kind of a reverse trigger uh, that arginine is, is the trigger to autoimmunity quite often. And L-lysine is kind of the reverse of that, the counterbalance to that. So those those two things were probably the most powerful. And then I kept going down the rabbit hole of, you know, oregano oil and garlic and liposomal C and mitochondrial ingredients. And there's a lot of things I've done to get myself to kind of full brightness. But at the time, those, those two were really big ones. Oh, cool. And how many years ago was when you hit bottom? Uh, that was about 25 years ago. That was really the, just the precursor to me pursuing this path of supplements and becoming a registered dietitian and all those things. Wow. So now do you look back at all that hell as a gift or do you still see it as just an awful chapter in your life? No, a thousand percent a gift. All of it's a gift. All of it's been a gift. Everything along the way, everything that's been difficult and you know, in some of the plant medicine work I've done, and some people might think this is woo or not, like I do believe that I've, I chose these lessons for this life. And there's a whole, <laughs> there's a whole lot I could say there. If, if you watch a, a short seven minute film called The Egg on YouTube, it might give you some perspective on what I'm talking about. It's really amazing. You yeah. may or may not agree with it. You may or may not agree with me and that's fine. But I do believe 
you know, even if you don't believe that maybe prior to this life that you chose this life for a reason to learn these lessons, I think you'd have to at least agree that during this life, we're making a lot of choices and these lessons can be used in your favor or not. It depends how you reframe. And I always choose to reframe. That's like, I've studied a lot of NLP, neuro linguistics programming, and it's about reframing a lot of the energy formula and like mindset, like whether it's stoicism or what have you, like is about reframing. That's a resilient mindset. So I believe absolutely everything that's happened to me along the way has given me my ability to understand like other people and what they're going through. It's made me that wounded healer that's, that's giving me my purpose and passion. Absolutely. Like this is, this is so critical to who I am. It's, it's made me an empath uh, to where I feel other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. People come up to me all the time and, and tell me about their health conditions, their suicidal thoughts, because I present on these things. I make myself vulnerable about these things. And that's a beautiful thing to have this impact. And then I would not have become what I am as far as a, a formulator had supplements not changed so much for me, had nutrition not changed so much for me. So I wouldn't be at the top of my industry. I wouldn't have written this book. I wouldn't have been on the stages I've been on of documentaries, TVs, like even if you remove accomplishment, it's not about how hard you work. That's part of it, but it's about your passion for it because I can take someone that works as hard as me every day of the week. I can take them down because I'm more passionate than them. So if you combine hard work and passion, I mean, sky's the limit. So I wouldn't have the drive had it not been for who I was. And so I recognize that and I, and I appreciate how hard I grinded, even though I don't want to be in that space anymore, it still served me, but my passion is still there and has always been there and it just continues to grow. So it's, it's all important. It's all, I'm all, I'm, I'm happy. I'm so happy that all of it's happened to me, honestly. Oh, beautiful. So if you chose this life, and I totally am on board with this concept of us choosing the life that we've been given and all the turmoil and challenges and everything, then it's the little things as well as the big things that you chose ahead of time, such as fellow students getting teased by teachers and the things that came out of their mouths make educators cringe. A fellow teacher would say that to a student. And so do you see those words as coming essentially from God or like, do you see that as part of the script that you were co-wrote with the creator on what your life was going to be like when you signed up for this? How do you think through this? In other words, I, that's very beautiful. Honestly, I've never put it in those words exactly, but I really took a second to just process that. And that's really beautiful. I like the way you put that, that I co-scripted it with God. I really like that idea a lot. Yes. I fully ascribe to what you just said. Now that's a great way to word it in truly what I believe it's divine. And it was my intended path and I've learned my intended lessons and absolutely. And you know what? It's, it's all like a, a a quilt that's being woven and that French teacher that would bully me, like she had her path, she had her lessons to learn too. And like, we're all playing out against each other. We're all projecting on each other. So it's, it's, it's a fascinating path and certainly a beautiful quilt that we're all, that yeah. we're all building. You know, there's a children's book by Neil Donald Walsh. I'd recommend you check out benefit from this book. It's kind of a short version of conversations with God, which is the book he's most known for. And premise of this book, uh, this children's book, is that we chose to incarnate in order to have these life lessons and to learn how to be who we already are. We are already forgiving. We're already loving. We are already generous and kind and so forth. But we wanted to experience that. We already are the light, but we wanted to have a chance to feel like we've earned it and not just been given it. So that means in order to have this opportunity to be the light in the form of, let's say, forgiveness, we need to have somebody that is needing to be forgiven. 
and it can be like, oh, sorry, I bumped into you. <laughs> uh, oh, no, that's fine. It has to be something pretty awful that makes it very hard for you to forgive so that you actually have to flex that muscle and grow that ability. So somebody has to be the bad guy, in other words, like the French teacher. The French teacher had to volunteer to be the bad guy or girl in this movie of yours. And then you had to get the lesson and then choose whether or not to forgive the teacher and whether to take that lesson, do something amazing with it, or just feel wounded by it. It's a beautiful book. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it before. No, I, I definitely would love to read it. Yeah, The Little Soul in the Sun. <laughs> yeah, pretty powerful. So what resonates there from what I was just describing? You know, I think of as we get older, my biggest lesson is that one, the love from God is unconditional and we feel like we're further and further from that as we get older. We also lose the ability to play, which is to me the ultimate expression of God. Like scientifically, I would refer to play as flow, like when you're in flow. If you think about when you're running around in recess and you know you had your just joyous times, like you were stimulated, you were in sympathetic nervous system, but you were also relaxed in parasympathetic nervous system. So there's this flow state of like the joining of the two where you're chasing, but also in surrender. And that's playful expression. That's when you're stimulated and relaxed. And that's like, that's such a beautiful space to be in. And to me, that's play. And that's why play is so important as we age, but also remembering that we're loved. When I went through my first plant medicine journey, that was profound for me. You could have told me before I went into that experience that I can have love, I can be love, love is unconditional. And I would have said, mm, yeah, okay, cool. But it's not until you feel it I went into this experience surrounded by all these celebrities and people that are in some pretty influential circles and very famous people that you know. And so I was kind of like intimidated. I mean, this is already my first experience, so that was a little scary. And then I was intimidated by the people there. And normally when I walk into these big rooms, I'm like, I was imposter syndrome and insecure. I'd give them my whole resume and tell them why I'm important and why I should be valued because you know, that's how I'd get approval. That's how I would feel needed. Because otherwise, if I didn't have their approval or they didn't see my value, then I thought I was worthless. And so getting into this space, and then I was, I was in this cuddle puddle on the floor, as it's called, like, you know, surrounded by all these people and these really important people. They kind of kept coming in and out of my circle, like one of those movies where the, you know, kind of time lapsed and people just kind of kept coming in and out of my circle, holding space for me, looking at me, helping me. And I thought the whole night, because I took a pretty heavy dose for my first time. And so it kind of cracked me open. The whole time I'm thinking like, why are these people here? Why would they want to be here when I'm no one? And I didn't tell them who I was to even earn some kind of love from them. So why would they just be nice to me? And that idea just blew me away that people would just want to be kind to me, that someone would want to hold space for me, even if I had no value to them. And I just always thought of myself as a human doing, not a human being. Like I couldn't just be Sean and be loved. But that was like the epiphany that night. And I stared at the ceiling for like three or four hours after everyone else went to sleep, just mind blown mm. that I could just have love and be loved, that love wasn't conditional. And for me, that was a massive game changer, a huge shift in my mentality, mm -hmm. radically changed my life path and how calm I feel internally, the, the inner peace I now have. Amazing. So if we tie that into what we were talking about just a couple minutes ago about the little soul and the sun and how your French teacher and everybody else was kind of in on the game, this script to this movie that you co-wrote with God, that means that those famous people were also in on it too. And they opted in to be supporting actors or even just extras in your movie. Yeah, that's beautiful. That is so beautiful. I think, yeah, that also reminds me of another, like I had a, a really famous hypnotist who was at a mastermind I was at. 
and he works with like elite pro poker players that need to be really dialed mentally. Like you have to be just completely bulletproof. You know how it is. Like if someone sees your tell, you're done. And so there's some of these guys are going for like 16 hours, 18 hours, whatever, like in these tournaments focused, right? Like sometimes they don't even get up to pee. It's just like, it's pretty intense. And so this guy um, was working with me and he told me, you know, he did the whole regression back to my childhood when I had a traumatic incident. You know, I'd heard of this before, like, you know, see yourself as the child in this traumatic incident, like walk into that frame and you know, see that child that's hurt, that's crying and, you know, give them a hug. And that was already powerful, right? Like I was already sobbing tears. I'm like, you know, I was just feeling what it, what it feels like to be an innocent child that's, that's hurting. And then he said, and this was like pivotal for me. He was like, who does that child think you are? Like, what does he see? I think I spent my whole life like desiring validation. That was the first time I ever gave it to myself. I was like, just, he's blown away at like this seven-year-old is blown away about what me as the, I think at the time, like 47 year old had accomplished to this point in his life. Like my dreams as a seven-year-old were like one-tenth of what I achieved. And so, you know, it was like, it was a beautiful thing that I realized that now at this point, I am a father to my inner child and I have to adult and protect my inner child. But I also have to let my inner child out and take care of my adult. <laughs> and I think like, you know, because I wasn't able to have a child in my, in my prior marriage, uh, we tried for seven years and did in vitro fertilization and then we even lost it. Uh, after we did a really complex process called uh, ICSI with that. And that was seven years of my life and then losing one and it was gut wrenching. And then I had another beautiful journey where that was the message where it's like, you know, you're both the parent and the child to yourself. And like that created like a wholeness to me that that was all I needed. Wow. So that hypnotist, uh, hypnotherapist wasn't Elliot, was it? It was. <laughs> So, you know, there are no coincidences, right? Yeah. So my, my oldest daughter, I was just having a conversation with a couple hours ago before this interview, and I have 400 and something episodes and she brings up the primed mind and it's like, y you know, I had Elliot on my podcast, right? And she's like, really? <laughs> she had no idea. So I actually had his, my interview of him up on the screen from just a couple hours ago. And here we are talking about it. There are no coincidences. There are no coincidences. You know, it's like the, the whole game is rigged in your favor. And the sooner you realize it, the sooner you can bend reality. And you remember that scene from The Matrix where the boy mm -hmm. is bending the spoon? Yeah, there is no spoon. There is no spoon. Exactly. That's amazing. Yep. So I'll link to the show note, the episode with Elliot Rowe in, in the show notes for this episode. So yeah, amazing. Amazing. Oh, this is uh, going a di different direction than I was anticipating, but I love it. I thought we were going to geek out on uh, a, a bunch of uh, supplements, but uh, no, this is, this is even better. So um, I wanted to touch on the angle of addiction and how sugar is super addicting. It's like cocaine. And somebody who has a bad sugar habit is going to have a hard time, let's say, throwing out all the cookies and candy and ice cream in the house. But they really need to do it, get it out of the house and into the trash, because otherwise they're eroding their willpower as the day goes on. And then eventually they give in to the vat of ice cream in their in their freezer. Um, but what, what else do you want to share about this this issue of sugar and getting off of it and things that you've learned and tools and resources that, that you recommend to your clients? So it's a great point. Um, there is this idea of the bliss point that foods are engineered to elicit a bliss point. It's essentially a food gasm. So we now have heavily engineered foods that mostly are eliciting dopamine release and it's a high spike and a high fall. Now there are healthy dopamine releases that can make you feel productive, make you feel in flow, make you feel swagger and things like working out 
or cold plunges or things like this can last for many hours. And those are healthy dopamine releases, of course, like relationships and playing, like I said, all these things are great for healthy dopamine releases that are extended. But we do see things like the reason that example comes up a lot is cocaine is kind of this super high dopamine spike and then super high crash. And it's why people keep going back to cocaine over and over and over. And it's just like sugar. Once we have some sugar, do we feel satiated? No, there's like the huge glycemic spike and then crash. And then we want more and more and more. And we were literally addicted. And if someone tells you that it's not nearly as addictive as something like cocaine, I would argue if I tried to take that candy away from that child or even this adult, tell me what happens. Tell me how people don't sneak it and hide it. People have like candy that they get by the register. Why is it by the register? Impulse. It's addiction. It's playing off your addiction. When you go into these convenience stores, you see the sea of colors when you're, you know, looking at the candy or you're looking at all the beverages in the cooler. Why are all these beautiful colors there? Because that's part of the addiction, the visual attraction. And of course, like when I drink like a soda, not only is there the sugar that's addictive, but then you have the, and they've engineered this, the, you know, there's that, that's an anchor and yeah. you hear it and you get the bubbles and the acidity and you have the sweetness. And then there's like the mouthfeel of the bubbles. And they even add sometimes like a, a little bit of gums or resin like in there. So it has like a little bit of a thickness to the, to the feel of the, even the soda. And then what they do is they flavor the front end and then leave nothing on the back end so that you, and you've seen people do this with the bottle, you know, they'll take the lid off, they'll drink, put it down, put the lid on, instantly take the lid back off, drink, put it down, put the lid on, pull the lid off, drink, and it'll just keep happening over and over. And this is like truly addiction and truly a process that does not like, you know, people say, oh, we need to have things in balance and, you know, ice cream and cookies and blah, all this stuff is great. All those things weren't there a couple hundred years ago, you know, and if you go to like other places in the world where there's, you know, tribes or whatever, like they were eating meat, they were eating fruit, they were eating vegetables, but they weren't having cakes and cookies and ice cream and refined sugar and high fructose corn syrup and these things that literally hijack our brain. So that's not about balance. And then you add in further hijacking the brain, the artificial colors and flavors. And I mean, there's so many chemicals that are there that are literally messing with your brain chemistry. And even the artificial sweeteners are doing this to your brain chemistry. And there's an element of addiction to it. It's absolutely problematic. It's why like, like, for example, like I said, when I went on a whole food, like paleolithic kind of diet, that it like helped me rewire my brain, my heavily addicted brain. So absolutely, that's that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. So what are some of easy wins for somebody who's addicted to sugar? Besides, if they're willing, getting the stuff out of the house and into the trash can, what else? Yeah, and, that, and that's a big step is just, uh, there's a study literally where they had M&Ms on a table within reach and then M&Ms on a table out of reach and the person that had them within reach because it's like our lazy brain it's they consumed like three times as many m&ms <laughs> so just having these things out of reach and out of your house is a huge step and just say like look i'm not getting off it but i'm not going to make it easy for myself and it's just like the positive habits you want to do make those easy for yourself by pre-packing your gym clothes and your sneakers and your gym bag to go work out right next to your bed in the morning. So that's one less hurdle. So you make those things lazy and thoughtless and easy, and then you make the things that you don't wanna do harder, put more barriers to them. And so one of the other techniques, especially with kids that I've worked with, you just include more of the good things and you naturally push out less of the bad things, quote unquote. So, you know, include more foods with color, include more whole foods, you know, so you have a colorful plate. And when you're full, you really don't have room for that kind of stuff. And getting enough sleep is going to be a massive, massive part of this. When we don't have enough sleep, 
we have an insufficient cellular energy state where we need more ATP. And your brain has essentially the same idea. It's called brain energy gap, where there's just not enough energy for the brain to properly function. So it's going to seek out quick energy and it's tired and your synapses are actually firing slower. So you're going to have one decision fatigue. You're going to have neuroinflammation. You're going to have a shortfall of ATP. Your neurotransmitters are already down. And then you're going to seek that high dopamine spike because you're already addicted because this is my way out of it. I'm going to feel good for 15 to 30 minutes. And you're probably going to add caffeine to that. And then a couple hours later, you're going to feel like crap and you're going to go back to the vending machine. You're going to get another, you know, a pizza, a donut or whatever. And you're not going to make healthy choices. So getting enough sleep is key to not eating as much sugar or having less productive behaviors. That's great advice. Now to get even more specific, if you wanted to get better sleep or more sleep, what are some of the mo most impactful sleep hacks, sleep hygiene mm -hmm. regimens that, that you would recommend? So keeping your bedroom a, a sleep fortress, that's actual term. So that means that when you go into your bedroom, it's anchored to sleep. It's not a place to have your office. It's not a place for arguments. It's not a place to have your TV. It's a place for sleep and potentially sex, like intimacy. Uh, but that's it. It's supposed to be a feeling of relaxing when you're walking into that room. Mm -hmm. So you protect it and you call it a sleep fortress. You have plants in there. So there's a carbon dioxide oxygen exchange. You put little uh, tape over like LEDs because those even uh, can disrupt sleep at night on your like smoke detectors, on your uh, TV, if you do have one, whatever like little devices and things that are around, uh, those LEDs can actually be a nuisance. Yeah. Get that TV out of the bedroom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, filtered air mm -hmm. is definitely a big factor. We often have a lot of allergens in the bedroom, especially if pets are in there. I would encourage you to not sleep with your pets. That can disrupt the quality of sleep. Um, I would encourage you to leave them like on the floor, like in, a, in their own bed, et cetera, especially if they're bigger pets, then them moving around in the night can contribute to you not sleeping as well. And even just frequent wake-ups can ruin your quality of REM and, and deep sleep. Using a red light at night, if you have to get up and go to the bathroom, use like a red light flashlight. You don't want to get blue light, which is like your standard white light uh, in your eyes, because that means that you will block the release of melatonin and it will be harder to, this certainly is true getting to sleep at the beginning of the night, but certainly even if you get up to go to the bathroom or what have you, it can also prevent you from getting back to sleep. So be mindful of that. Uh, and that's so along those lines, make sure that before bed, probably two to three hours before bed, that there's no devices. And I know that's hard for a lot of people, but this means cutting out TV, phones, tablets, computers, and now stuff like that Apple Vision Pro or the Meta, you know, Quest and all this kind of stuff is probably the worst thing imaginable. I, I can't think of anything worse. Like I thought a phone was bad at night, right by your face. But now we have a thing strapped to our eyeballs that's firing bright light into them. You are guaranteed to not sleep from that. You'll literally block melatonin from releasing at all. So you're going to have to drug yourself. And then some people resort to alcohol, which actually worsens quality of sleep as well. So that's another thing. Avoid alcohol in the evenings. If you're going to drink something, make sure it's earlier in the day and not later in the evening. It's also not healthy to eat too late because your body will be digesting that food and that tends to worsen quality of sleep and HRV heart rate variability, which is a marker of how well you recover, how well you've slept. So those are some big things that I would say that come off the top of my head. And I certainly cover them all in my book. I think one more like really interesting sleep hack that you've probably heard of, but a lot of people haven't and is pretty much free is taping your mouth because a lot of us are mouth breathers. And even if you're not apneic where you're kind of choking and have huge gaps between breaths, 
that aren't healthy. And that's really a concern because that can put you at risk for stroke and heart attack and diabetes and a lot of very serious conditions. So apnea is very concerning. But even if you're just breathing through your mouth and you're just snoring, your sleep quality, your recovery could be so much better through the nose because the nose is where we're supposed to take in air and it's naturally filtered, it's moisturized, it's um, the, the temperature is correct. And so it's a very different effect on recovery and oxygenation when you're breathing through the nose. So if you just tape your mouth at night, give it a try, see what happens. I know the first time I did it, I got four hours of sleep that night and felt like I got eight and a half. So I didn't realize like how bad my sleep was breathing through my mouth, mm. even though I was getting enough. Yep. Those are all great uh, tips. Really, really fabulous. Is there a particular device that you recommend either for tracking or for uh, sleep improvement? So for example, uh, I use an Aura Ring to track my sleep. I, I used to use the Zio way back in the day, which was a, a strap around my, uh, around my forehead that measured my brainwave state while I was sleeping. You know, there are different kinds of, uh, of devices for helping you get into a deeper sleep, you know, pr prior to uh, going to bed, like a brain tap, for example, do a brain tap mm -hmm. meditation uh, shortly before you go to sleep. Any particular technologies you like? Yeah, I like several of those. So I do use the Aura Ring. Um, I've also experimented with Garmin. They have a good, really a great watch that has the whole idea of body battery, which is essentially the same as Aura tracking HRV. I did just read that Aura is launching a new feature around this time. So it should be out any day that is just called resilience, where it's taking kind of like the body battery by, by Garmin was kind of like one upping the idea of HRV and making it more accessible. So Aura is going to take in uh, levels of stress your heart rate and HRV and, and kind of process the whole thing together to give you like a resilient score throughout the day. Mm. So I think that's really exciting. I do like, I think whoop has a good one, especially more for athletes. Uh, that, that seems to be more accurate than aura ring. I think aura rings a great all arounder. Um, and there's a number of companies now coming out with rings. Um, Samsung has a really well-rated ring in their whole Galaxy line uh, that I've been reading about. I know Apple's supposedly working on their ring. Um, and there's two other companies I've been reading. So the, the ring thing, I think, is about to, to take off and Aura is about to get a whole lot of competition, which is, which is good for us. And I do like the Apollo Neuro mm -hmm. actually for the vibrations helped me get into more of that parasympathetic state. Now it's actually I'm friends with the, the CEO and, and founder, uh, Dr. Dave Rubin. What's really cool is it's now attached to the aura ring so that like it can sense that you woke up and you need to get back to sleep. So it will turn the device back on and vibrate on your wrist or your ankle and so that you fall back asleep more quickly. And I have been using, I have like a, a Manta mask that I use at night. That's another thing that I do think is important is blocking out of this blue light, especially when I travel. Oh my gosh, like the, the light coming in from these windows, these curtains that don't fully close and there's street lights out there and then, you know, parking lights and whatever. And then there, you could be by a highway and there's a lot of noise and there's noise in the hallway and there's light coming in under the door. So not only, you know, I used to use just the sleep mask, but now I travel so much. They have an upgraded one that has Bluetooth, uh, like right here at the ears and has like these light little speakers that you can actually sleep on, on your sides. And it's still comfortable and you can kind of move them around to fit you perfectly. And that's helped a lot that, and I used to use brown noise, which I thought was the best of kind of all the noises, pink noise, white noise, et cetera. But now I've been really exploring some of these more uh, binaural-ish things that are on uh, YouTube that are free, that are like 11 hour recordings. Mm -hmm. And it'll be like the, you know, the 432 Hertz or like this one's a healing, you know, frequency. And, and I've actually just been exploring all these different frequencies and this one's the God frequency, <laughs> you know, and 
I don't know a lot of uh, specifics around these different frequencies, but I have been exploring it and seeing what my HRV is on, on different ones. And this is just something I've been doing over the past month. So I'm, uh, I'm trying to figure out which one kind of does the best for me, but um, I've definitely noticed like a deeper sleep just using this, these, these different frequencies and these 11 hour recordings and it seems to be better than like just brown noise, which is, you know, just, you know, that kind of thing. Have, have you tried uh, focus at will? Focus at will. No. Yeah. You might try that. You know, so it, okay. it is a paid subscription, but it's very inexpensive. Uh, will Henshaw is, is the founder. It's a, yeah, I've had him on this podcast, by the way, really interesting technology and it helps you to get into uh, either a flow state if you want to be productive or helps you get into the like theta brainwave state if you're relaxed and go to sleep uh, yeah it's just a, it's kind of like a netflix for you know different kinds of music and uh, background noise uh, background you know, sounds for whatever you're trying to accomplish it's all based on science and everything yeah yeah it's pretty cool Okay. Yeah. So if um, uh, you had just one or two tips to share in these last few minutes that we haven't discussed about making one's life better, you know, making it better in terms of health, wellness, longevity, mindset, spiritual uh, connection, any of that, what would it be? Yeah. So what I've been exploring, you know, I, I did a conscious uncoupling and, and that was very powerful. She's still a, a best friend and a business partner. A lot of that came out of my work in psychedelics to like get the courage up to finally do what I needed to do to really, I like, it was nice that we had a great friendship and we relied on each other, but there wasn't that intimacy, that, that deeper love that I longed for. And now that I'm in the relationship I'm in, I've been for a year and a half. It's a powerful relationship where she's been through a lot and she's a mirror to me and I'm a mirror to her. There's two things that I've found really new that are epiphanies to me is the dopamine detox. Speaking of that before, you know, just getting rid of all the things that were like dopamine addicted, like I was talking about before with, with food and sodas, even sugar-free sodas and even sugar-free BCAA drinks and all these things that are just hyper palatable, um, getting rid of those masturbation and porn. Like that's a huge thing. Like I noticed myself desiring that often when I was bored, when I like, fill the time, like when I was hurt, when I was sad and it's a downward spiral. And I also noticed myself making more impulsive decisions like sports cars and driving really fast and weaving in and out of traffic. And, you know, why am I doing these things or just there's so many decisions that more impulsive decisions, more reckless decisions, more short term thinking decisions, how I'm spending my money inst instead of saving it. It's like all of these kinds of things like I found were because of like dopamine drive, because I didn't have enough inside. I wasn't spending enough time inside my heart, inside my soul. Like here, here's my test for you that I can tell you. Mm -hmm. if, if I put you in a float tank for one hour, if it's your personal hell for that one hour to have no light, no sound, complete deprivation, and you think you cannot operate and you cannot wait to break that thing open and get out of there. <laughs> That is a sure sign. And you want to talk about the ultimate dopamine addiction is this thing, this thing, this thing that's in her hand, in her pocket 24 seven, that when I walk around an airport and I see everyone just looking at the phone instead of like acknowledging the person next to them. I mean, tell me it's not an addiction. If someone has it out on the table at a dinner table, I mean, I tell them to put that thing away. It is literally like this is impulse all day long and it's firing notifications at you all day long. It's terrible. Yeah, you'll it's even get that's... phantom uh, uh, vibration. vibration. You don't have it in yeah. your pocket. It's like you go check and oh yeah, it's not in my, <laughs> it's not in my pants. Where is it? Yeah. And now people are wearing the watches and we're even more connected and it's just, it's, and like I said, these vision pros, like it, it's kind of disturbing to me, like how productive I get it, but also it's coming at a cost. And for me to detox from dopamine, if you look up dopamine fasting 2.0, dopamine detox, things like that, for me, just 
I found abstaining from masturbation porn completely and just focusing on my relationship and intimacy, me avoiding any snacks whatsoever, just focusing on enjoying a meal, taking bites, but chewing many times and enjoying that. Being present, noticing the air, noticing the sun, noticing the sounds around you instead of being distracted with the cell phone or whatever else, the TV, whatever else is around you, being truly present. Like this, the dopamine fasting thing has been very powerful for me. And that's led to me being able to do the next one, which is getting in line with who I want to be spiritually, physically, mentally, and keeping my word, most importantly, not only to you and everyone around me, but to myself. The things I say I'm going to do, I now do. And so if I say something to myself, I'm very careful about it because I need to follow through on that. I don't want to have, I call it like spiritual dissonance when I don't keep in line with the things that I said I'm going to do. If I said I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow morning, I'm going. I'm hell or high water. If I said I'm going to show up at this event, I'm going to show up at that event. That's the way I have to like proceed with my life is like having that radical integrity and everything starts to change from there. But also like the two other things I mentioned earlier, I think are very important too, is granting yourself grace, like just having forgiveness, like how beautiful this life is. And life isn't about perfectionism and certainly like the, the concern for making mistakes. Almost every beautiful thing that's ever happened in this world has come out of a quote unquote mistake. And that means that you have to have instead of a mindset for perfectionism is a mindset for play. Because when you play, there's nothing wrong. There's no wrong situations that come up. You're just in your heart, you're in your flow. That's where creativity happens. That's where the beautiful things get constructed and created. That's where collaboration happens. Like we need to play. And if you want to be better at your business, you want to be more successful at life, figure out how to play more. Amen. That's amazing. Well, this was a, a whole lot of wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing from your heart, from your incredible experience and your expertise. And yeah, it's just a, you're, you're an inspiration. Oh, thank you. I didn't talk about supplements at all. And I'm a supplement guy, but <laughs> maybe I can... <laughs> Come back on for round two and we can talk about supplement stacks. Yeah, that would be awesome. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Sean. And thank you, listener. Thank you for being open-minded and full of hope and trust that, you know, everything is always working out for you. We'll catch you in the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.